Hello, and thank you all for being here. Um, so uh, I met James uh, over a year ago at uh, a conference with Richard Rohr, and a um, beautiful conversation. And what struck me so authentically was the way he was able to explain the intersectionality between pains and injustices that we all feel, maybe from different vantage points, and the impact that has on us all. Uh, so I was profoundly impacted by that and had a few conversations uh, a little over a year ago, and here we are today. Um, James Allison is a priest, theologian, and author, born in England. Uh, he has lived and worked in Mexico, Brazil, Bolivia, Chile, and the United States. James has worked on applying the mimetic theory of French thinker René Girard to the basic Christianity and published several books uh, in this field, including <coughs> Jesus the Forgiving Victim, uh, a course of introduction to Christian faith for adults. In addition, uh, James is known for having taken a firm but gentle stance affirming honesty uh, on matters of LGBT within his own uh, church, that being the Catholic Church, where his positions once seemed outlandish but are now heading for the mainstream. Currently, he lives in Madrid, Spain, with his son, Luis Felipe, uh, and his grandson, as well as a French bulldog, Nicholas. Please welcome James Allison. <laughs> Yeah, I should say it's not as well as my grandson, as well as the French Bulldog, my grandson is the French Bulldog. <laughs> <laughs> that is quite enough. Well, what an honor it is to be here speaking in the great state of Texas today, the day when your junior senator tweeted his liking of a hard porn uh, website. <laughs> it's a high bar to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to rise to, but we're going to move to that source of even harder porn, the, uh, the Bible, <laughs> as we come to talk today. Um, I want to approach this issue from some strange angle, read a couple of stories that have nothing to do with matters LGBT, so as to give us a little bit of distance and background and context. And the first of our lovely, uh, as I say, semi-pornographical endeavors is this little gem from the book of Genesis. Noah was the first tiller of the soil. He planted a vineyard and he drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father. Apparently that's a euphemism, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and walked backwards and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a slave of slaves shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed by the Lord my God, be Shem, and let Canaan be his slave. God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his slave. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Are you familiar with this passage? You all heard it before? Where was it most frequently preached? What was it the proof text for? Oh, you should know. Slavery. Slavery. In any church, at least in the southern half of this great land, between about 1800 and about 1950, you could have heard on a regular basis this text being adduced with very great determination as the sure sign that 
black slavery was decreed and wanted by God himself because of what Ham did to Noah. You see, according to the biblical exegesis of the time, Shem was the father of the Semites and therefore the white people. Japheth was the father of the yellow people. And Ham was the father of the black people. So God wanted black people to be slaves forever. And anyone who didn't go along with that, why? They were disrespecting the word of God. It was clear that the plain meaning of scripture was that God wanted black slavery. Now when was the last time you heard that text preached in one of your churches in that sense? <coughs> Not so recently is my guess. I was thrilled. I tried this exercise with some kids in Louisiana a few years ago just to see if there were any memories and they, they looked at me with utter amazement. And yet their granddaddies would have known very well <laughs> what the text meant. And they would have known the huge weight of authority that was given to those who interpreted it so perfectly and could demonstrate with such a paraphernalia of apparatus of texts that this was the word of God. It was infallible and anybody who didn't hold to it wasn't really a Christian. In fact, some scholars did a, a survey of preaching during the 19th century and discovered that those who preached what modern people would call the revisionist version, otherwise known as this text has nothing whatever to do with black slavery, and it was something like 5%. The vast majority bought the line that this was to do with black slavery. And yet, that interpretation has disappeared like the morning mist at noon. Not, I should say, the social consequences of the lifestyle that was being uh, reinforced by the use of that text, but the text itself if you didn't know that story, you would be struck by mystery. You would say, how did they get from A to B? Is that a fair, is that a fair point? OK. So what I'm going to invite you to do is to consider 150 years hence, when we have exactly the same WTF, I believe is the word, reaction, <laughs> <laughs> with the texts currently used to attack gay and lesbian people. The use of scripture for scapegoating is very easy, but it doesn't last. Scapegoaters move on to the next, the next target. We'll see at the end how Jesus undoes this. But the first, let's just have a look at some of the things that are going on. I want to read to you one of my favorite uh, biblical texts, one of the sort which I imagine you read to yourselves before going to sleep every night. <laughs> because I know that here in the seminary, that's encouraged. And this is a lovely little reading from 2 Samuel. And I'm going to give it to you in the Revised Standard Version. After this, Oh, just to fill in a little bit of background, 2 Samuel, that's to do with David, for those of you who are not Protestants yet, okay? If we've got any good Catholics like me, we tend not to know these things, so. <laughs> After this, the king of the Ammonites died, and Hanan, his son, reigned in his stead. General background, Ammonites, boo, Israelites, yay. Okay. <laughs> After this, the king of the Ammonites died, and Hanan, his son, reigned in his stead. And David said, I will deal loyally with Hanan, the son of Nahash, as his father dealt loyally with me. 
So David sent by his servants to console him concerning his father. And David's servants came into the land of the Ammonites. But the princes of the Ammonites said to Hanan their lord, Do you think, because David has sent comforters to you, that he's honouring your father? Has not David sent his servants to you to search the city and to spy it out and to overthrow it? So Hanan took David's servants and shaved off half the beard of each and cut off their garments in the middle at their hips, as it says in the RSV, at the buttocks, as it says more correctly in the King James Version. King James was less uh, squeamish than the people became later. Cut off their garments in the middle at their buttocks and sent them away. When it was told David, he sent to meet them, for the men were greatly ashamed. And the king said, remain at Jericho until your beards have grown and then return. So, as you say, uh, as you imagine, I think of you meditating on this day and night, part of the, the word of the Lord, and I hope that you can see exactly what's going on here. King David has sent two messengers to give his uh, condolences to the king, the new young king, and the royal elders, the, the managers, the General Kelly and the General Mattis, making sure that the boy king is not too prone to tantrums. Uh, <laughs> they're concerned that the two angels or messengers really are spies, just like the men of Sodom were concerned that the angels were spies. Angel and messenger is the same word. And so they convince the boy king not to treat them as uh, messengers ambassadors of condolence, but as spies, and therefore they decide ritually to humiliate the king, King David, by ritually humiliating his messengers. Absolute standard practice. And of course, it's all very euphemistic here. So he took David's servants and shaved off half the beard of each. This doesn't mean that he gave them a kind of a metrosexual buzz <laughs> round, the, round the beard. It meant that this side baby face and this side full bog brush, you know, the, so that they looked silly, okay? They looked <gasps> like half men or <gasps> women. <gasps> <laughs> Hint, this is a misogynistic text. <laughs> and cut off their garments in the middle at their buttocks. Why? As a sign that they had been Word beginning with B dot 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 F. But fucked. Yep, yeah, okay. That was the purpose of this exercise. Whether they had been or not, it didn't matter. The point was to expose them to the shame of being thought to have been. So they were going to have to wander through the countryside. I told you this was better than Ted Cruz. Um, <laughs> they were going to have to wander through the countryside butt naked which meant that all the little boys were going, yeah, 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 look at them, they got, yeah, yeah, they got fucked. Yeah. So they come to Jericho, and they send a message to King David, and he sent to meet them, and they were greatly ashamed. And what did King David say? Did he say, oh my Lord, now I have to stone you to death because it says in the book of Leviticus, a man who lies with a man, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I really don't want to do that, but I've got to because it says in the book of Leviticus. No, he doesn't. Why? Because the book of Leviticus hasn't been written yet. But that's another... <laughs> <laughs> that's another point. <laughs> but the second point is because he understands what it's all about. So he says, remain at Jericho until your beards have grown and then return. In other words, tunics that cover the butt, that we can provide. Beards, that takes a little longer. <laughs> so stay around until your beards have grown again and then come back. Okay, do you see what's going on here? Do you see the, the expectations and behavior patterns that people thought were common at the time? This was a completely standard way of humiliating the principal by humiliating the agent. It would have been an absolute standard practice at the time. It has absolutely nothing to do with what we call homosexuality. 
And it has everything to do with power and shaming, <laughs> as must be perfectly obvious. For modern day uh, livings out of this sort of thing, you need to go to jail, <laughs> right? People making each other their bitches or their punks or whatever the, the term is. This is dog marking out territory stuff, right? <laughs> and that's perfectly well understood. People understood exactly how that worked. Why don't you think they bring that text out when they want to attack gay and lesbian people? Because it kind of gives the whole thing away, doesn't it? <laughs> it kind of gives it away that what's really going on here is a discussion about a power dynamic in a rather brutal society the kind of Abu Ghraib world. And of course that's an abomination. It wouldn't occur to anyone in their right mind that it's not an abomination. That it was, and alas, continues to be in some places, an acceptable form of social demarcation of who has power and who is to be shamed, is an abomination. But the notion that this has anything to do with quote unquote homosexuality a word that was invented in what year, anybody? In the advance of 1940. We have 1940 here, in the advance of 1940. You give me 1940, I raise you 1869. 1860, 1869, okay? That's AD, not BC. In other words, it's a very modern word. And anybody who thinks they are reasonably translating any passage in this ancient book <laughs> by using that 19th century word, which was an attempt to give a clinical definition to what had been somewhat of a mystery to the medical and psychological profession. And they were trying, actually they were trying to be kind to the people involved by treating it as something clinical rather than something criminal. So it was a movement in the right direction. But it was a clinical term, and it's not a term, nor are its resonances terms which we can find anywhere in this very, very ancient book. Now, why have I started with that way? I've started with two texts. One, to show how things which are apparently written in stone really aren't. <laughs> and that once people get over particular forms of cruelty, that they claim define Christianity, which was the claim made in the 19th century <laughs> with relation to black slavery, and is the claim made in certain circles, Nashville, uh, in, the, in the 20th, uh, 21st century, oh yes, 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 well, for those of us who've got that, um, regarding this issue, they claim that it's definitive of what Christianity is about. Well, let's remember that these claims of issues that are definitive of what Christianity is about, have a long history, and uh, history is littered with their gravestones. So let's uh, just remember to be able to take distance. And second, let's remember that when we're looking at this ancient book, we are dealing with ways of living together of which we have very little grasp, and certainly which can't be fit neatly into patterns that we understand. And do you know who says this very, very clearly? A surprising source. The uh, Pontifical Council for the Bible. Pontifical Biblical Con uh, Council. In the Vatican City. They came up with a very good document in early 2000s, signed by their then Cardinal Prefect, a man called Joseph Ratzinger. Hmm, what became of him, I wonder. But the interesting thing is that this, doc this document made it absolutely clear that it is a grave failure of charity and exactitude to actualize, by which they mean treat as if they were modern realities, <laughs> the ancient and diverse realities which are explained in, in Scripture. In other words, it's actually wrong <laughs> to actualize the text. And they give us a particular example of this. They say, anyone 
who translates and reads the word Judaioi, which we normally translate as the Jews, as if referring to the ethnic group of human beings whom we now refer to as the Jews, is making a grave misreading of scripture. The word Judaioi, as it appears in the New Testament, must never be translated literally as the Jews. That's actually the Vatican's official position. <laughs> Just so, so, so remember, there are a group of people who are pretty darn good at being fundamentalists when they want to. <laughs> are seriously not fundamentalist on this, on this score. And say, so remember, that actualizations of ancient realities which work in a direction contrary to charity and have negative effects on the people so described are to be avoided at all costs. That's more or less quoting verbatim. Just so as to give you an idea that it's not, uh, this is not some weird, wacky uh, thing which I'm suggesting. Okay. I don't know how it is with you, but each generation goes by, and the generation before had learned how to cope with the, the clobber texts, <laughs> and then you suddenly find that no one's bothered to explain it to the next generation, <laughs> because it's assumed that they already know. Is that something of the case here? Shall I do a little rattle through some of those, those texts, just so as to... You know what the, the texts are which are used. First of all, there's the famous the, the text of Sodom, Genesis 19. Well, you really do need to be, at this stage of history, you need to be pretty perverse to read that as having anything to do with homosexuality. It doesn't stop people having a go, of course, because it's perfectly clear that it's part of a ritual humiliation, but it's made even clearer by the fact that the Bible itself interprets the sin of Sodom. <laughs> the prophet Ezekiel, for instance, goes on at length about how the sin of Sodom was pride, inhospitality, uh, what's the word, arrogance with relation to foreigners. That's quite a long spiel about it. It's quite clear that there was an ancient way of understanding the sin of Sodom. And it was only after the first century AD that even Jewish authorities start basically uh, starting from readings of Philo of Alexandria. The Jewish authorities, rabbinical authorities, started reading it in the new way as having something to do with homosexuality. But before the first century AD, you're still in the old world where they understood that it was failure of hospitality and rejection which of course is exactly the sense that Jesus applies to those texts because he says to Capernaum and to Bethsaida, woe is it for you, it will be better for Sodom on the day of, of destruction because he sends messengers to them and if they do not accept the messengers, if they reject the messengers, then it will be worse for them than on the day of Sodom. In other words, he understands it to do with rejecting messengers. <laughs> Jesus' Jesus' reading of those texts is still thoroughly within the old, pre-anything to do with modern people <laughs> account. But in case you're ever in doubt yourselves, and this is a fun thing to do, I can't do it with you today because we don't have enough time. If ever you have the time or the chance, maybe in a, a seminary class, get a group of 30 or so people, more, 40 if you can, divide them into two, make one group Sodomites and the other Benjaminites. And don't all rush to be sodomites at once. <laughs> <coughs> okay. <laughs> okay. 50-50, uh, be fair. Okay. Yeah. Print off the texts of Genesis 19, and then print off the texts of Judges 19 to 21, the last three chapters of the book of Judges, which is the story of the rape of the Levites' concubine at Gibeah. It's actually probably the nastiest story of all the nasty stories in the Old Testament. The Old Testament's pretty good on nasty stories. And this is possibly the vilest of them all. There's a beautiful, beautiful reading of it by Phyllis Tribble in her book, Texts of Terror, if ever you uh, want, to, uh, uh, want to have a look at it, because it's, it really is the, the culmination of the misogynistic uh, world. But one of the advantages of getting people to act these out side by side, you don't tell them beforehand how to divide the texts, how to do the acting, is that invariably 
they'll have to act them out the same way. Why? Because it's the same story. In the story of Sodom, two angels come to the city. They're about to bed down for night in the square, in the city square, when uh, a resident alien, someone who lives there but is not from there, comes in and says, uh, I shouldn't spend the night in the square there, boys. If I were you, you know, <laughs> I know the people around here. They're not a friendly bunch. Um, so they say, no, no, we're perfectly fine, we're fine. He said, no, no, you aren't. Come in. So he offers them hospitality. And in the city of Gibeah, what happens is the, Levi, the Levite and his concubine, they are on their way back from a family visit, and they pass by uh, a non-Israelite city, so as they think they'll get good, better hospitality as an Israelite city. So they settle in Gib Gib um, is it Gibeah? Yeah, Gibeah, in the tribe of Benjamin. They think, oh, we'll be safe here. So they come in, they bed down in the square in the night, and guess what? A resident alien comes by, someone who lives there but's not from there, and says, oh, I wouldn't spend the night in the square, boys, or boy and girl. Um, dangerous place, I know my people. And eventually, he persuades them to come in the house. And then it says in both cases, but the men of the city, base fellows, it actually uses the same phrase in both cases, came together and they were protesting. You see, for them, a resident alien offering hospitality was maybe rather like somebody with a Middle Eastern name here <laughs> offering hospitality to uh, a not so legal immigrant and uh, Homeland Security and ICE want to know what's going on because they're frightened that these people might have designs on the city. So, in one case, they come knocking at the door and want to come in. And uh, so the host and the angel say, oh, don't, don't do anything vile. They say, we want to know these men. And everyone knows exactly what that means. That means ritual humiliation, which incidentally is ritual humiliation of the host. It's you lot don't have enough brownie points amongst us to be able to offer hospitality to foreigners. We are dragging you down a notch by treating your guests as women. Okay? But luckily, because they're angels, they throw pixie dust in their, in their face. So the people, who are, uh, the people who are at the door wander around and get lost, okay? In the other town, they come to the door, and it's the same thing. Uh, the first, in the first instance, Lot and the angels try to offer their virgin daughters to the, to the people, but as I say, the pixie dust gets in the way of that operation. Um, in the second operation, the host and the Levite come to the door and say, oh, oh, don't do such a terrible thing, but here, I have a virgin daughter and this man has a concubine, so take them. Mysteriously, the host's virgin daughter is somehow kept inside, but the concubine gets thrown out, and she is gang-raped all night and left for dead on the doorstep. And the, the Levite gets up the next morning, tells her to wake up. She doesn't, because she's dead. He throws her on the back of a donkey and wanders back home. When he gets home, he cuts her up into 12 portions and uh, FedExes her throughout the, the land of Israel so that each tribe gets a chunk of her. Lucky FedEx deliverer. And they're all suitably horrified by this, such a lovely surprise at their breakfast table. And um, they come together saying, who has done this abomination? What has done this terrible thing? And then the Levite tells them the story. Meanwhile, in the other story, uh, Lot is going to escape from the destruction that is going to come. So he and his daughters leave. Mrs. Lot gets stuck on the way. But they get out of uh, town in time. And then the destruction comes. Boom. The destruction is fire and brimstone in the one case, and in the second case, the destruction is the other 11 tribes coming in and completely massacring the people of Benjamin, killing all of them, all the women and children. Somehow 600 men were slightly less brave than the women and children, and so they managed to run away. So there are 600 men who are left over, and in the case of Lot, it's Lot and his two daughters who are left over. And in both cases, you have a similar problem now at the end. We have a, an inheritance problem. What are we going to do? In the case of Lot's daughters, they had nice sodomite boyfriends. In the day before, it was fashionable. And uh, they 
are worried that they're not going to get any descendants. No gabies. No. Um, they're worried they're not going to get any descendants, so they decide that they need to get their dad drunk and rape him while drunk. You can tell this is a man story, really, can't you? The male, no, 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 they got me drunk. I really, I mean it, I mean it, really. <laughs> this is a male version of the story, unquestionably. But anyhow, the, the two daughters get uh, uh, a lot drunk, and by that they get descendants, so the line is able con to continue, and you have the people of Moab thereafter. Uh, in the other story, the Benjaminites, well, 600 of them run away, 600 blokes, and there are no women left. So after a bit, they realize that the tribe of Benjamin is going to die out. So they uh, send an urgent message to the other tribe saying, do you really want us to, uh, to die out? And the, uh, Benjaminites, uh, the rest of the people will say, oh, yeah, no, not really. But, you know, we did swear an oath to the Lord saying that we would not give you any of our wives and daughters. So we can't do that. But, oh, good idea. We're about to have a harvest festival, which means that there's going to be dancing. So it's going to happen in such and such a place on such and such a day. So why don't you hide behind the bushes while we have our dance festival? And uh, then our maiden daughters will all be dancing. And, and if you hide behind the bushes, you can rush on stage, carry them off, and uh, rape them. And that will make them your wives. And of course, then we won't have given them to you. So we won't have broken our word to the Lord. Nice solution. And so that was what happened. So this is the reading according to the Book of Family Values, part the third. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, OK. What I want to bring out in this, this comparison of ghastliness is that structurally, those two stories are identical. Yeah? The only difference between the two is that one has some mythical elements, fire and brimstone, pillar of salt, angels, pixie dust. The other has all exactly the same dynamic, all in purely anthropological terms. Yeah? Everything that happens in it, the act of destruction, every single element is explained by perfectly human interactions between the texts. But what you've got is identical structure, marginal differences within the storytelling. But one thing is perfectly clear, that neither has anything to do with sexual orientation. No more should sodomites be sent to be cured from sodomy, or Benjaminites be sent to be cured from that icky thing, heterosexuality. No. The two have nothing to do with each other. Right? We're talking about grotesque stories of misogyny, shaming, and power. Right? Does that make sense? Good. This helps to understand the background to everything else that goes on <laughs> in those texts. <laughs> the next text, this is actually the, the only text that's genuinely difficult if you happen to be an Orthodox Jew concerning the gay issue in Scripture, is the other two bits in Leviticus, where the actual text doesn't say, as it's usually translated, thou shalt not lie a man with a man as with a woman. It says, thou shalt not lie the lyings of males with a woman. Plural lyings with a woman, singular. But first, a key point about this passage. Before I try to say what it might mean, and there's a very great deal of uncertainty as to what it might mean. Whatever it might mean, it means it in particular for Orthodox Jews. Whatever it means, it does not mean it at all for Gentiles. <laughs> because the holiness code of the book of Leviticus does not apply to Gentiles. <laughs> St. Peter had a dream when he was asleep on the roof of the house of Simon the Tanner. <laughs> and he saw various beasties being let down. <laughs> And he was told, take and eat, and he refused three times. Then he heard a voice crying. In the Greek, it's exactly the same verb as the cock crying three times. He hears the voice crying, calling him to come to the house of Cornelius the Centurion. And it's perfectly clear that he's, he realizes that there's a link between him refusing something and him having refused Jesus. 
And by the time he gets to Cornelius' house, he dares to go in, which he shouldn't do. And he realizes that he has been told not to call any human profane or unclean. Now, how he got from the icky beasts to any human shows that he understood that it was linked to his cowardice with relation to Jesus. And that now standing up for Jesus means standing up for a living dead man, a glorious polluting corpse. And that therefore the law is over for those who don't have to hold it. So he goes into the house of the Gentiles and he notices as he's explaining to them who Jesus was that the Holy Spirit falls on them and he says, who, who am I to withhold baptism? But the key line is when he says, God has told me to call no person impure or profane. That is the first and only use of the Petrine keys in scripture. It's when he unbound the heavens to Gentiles. <laughs> and how did he unbind the heavens to Gentiles? I take it for granted that most of us here are Christians from gentility. He unbound it by letting us off the holiness code. <laughs> yeah? So we can eat shellfish and other things like that without troubling our consciences. Now, this passage, the passage which is usually used, Leviticus, as though it were not part of the Holiness Code, but some special commandment of God about beating up gay people. Here's a really interesting phenomenon. Even Philo of Alexandria, a contemporary, a slightly later contemporary of St. Paul, so just a little bit later than Jesus, even Philo of Alexandria thought that that passage referred to shrine prostitution which is scarcely surprising. If you read the beginning of the verse, uh, of the chapter in which it comes, it says, it gives a long critique of the practices of the Moabites and the Canaanites and the Ammonites and the Amorites and all the otherites that you can think of, which you are not to do. <laughs> and of course, it makes much more sense if you're going to have plural lyings with a singular woman <laughs> that it be referring to prostitution. In both cases, there is incidentally, this, this, some experts have started to question that nowadays, not on, the, not on the grounds that it's really something to do with what we would call gay, which, as I say, remember, 19th century word, or homosexuality, a 19th century word, not on their horizons. <laughs> the, the, the first reference does appear to be to do with um, cultic prostitution. Do you, do you know what cultic prostitution was? To fill you in, the fertility gods, the fertility uh, goddesses, it was assumed in some of the uh, uh, surrounding peoples that um, the gods needed help causing fertility and that therefore if people would come to the temple and fuck a lot, then this would really help things grow. <laughs> and it didn't particularly matter whether they fucked men or women, just a lot of fucking. This is, <laughs> this is really quite important. And if you got tired out of doing it with people you knew or liked, then there were shrine prostitutes, you know. So this was a perfectly standard part of the ancient world <laughs> that the people of Israel had said, this is not the kind of thing we do. And instead, it's not because they were timid about sex. It's because they understood that this was an attempt to manipulate God. The whole point of the one true God is that God is not manipulable. So sex and fertility cults, much more than anything to do with sexual morality, is wrong because it's an affront to God who is not one of the gods. <laughs> it's idolatry that's the problem. Yeah? Just to fill in on the background of that. But <coughs> that's the chapter heading, if you like, of the list of things that you're not supposed to do so as not to be like the Canaanites and the Amorites and all the otherites. Now, interesting enough, there are some people who are beginning to suggest, and this is very close exegesis, and this is way beyond my professionality, 
that suggests that actually it may have something to do with an incest taboo. Um, because some of the uh, other um, elements in the in the list of in uh, the list of of things which are not to be done include things that are with people who are in too close proximity. So that's one of the uh, that's one of the possibilities. And, uh, that's an area that's being uh, that's being followed more and more closely. Um, one of the key things that's worth remembering is that all of these are described as toiva. Toiva is the word which in our Bibles is translated abomination. One of the difficulties for us is that because we live in a world in which there are very few ritual structures, we tend to associate the word abomination with moral issues. Whereas actually they had rather different words for moral issues. Abomination refers to purity issues, ritual issues. It's taboo. It's radically against purity. It's unkosher. So we find it very difficult to get a sense of what it might mean for those particular sins. But what it really means is not for the people of Israel, or not particularly for the men of Israel to do. So whatever it is that's being commanded is not for the men of Israel to do because it's against purity. And the whole point of the Holiness Code is that it's what makes Israel pure and separate from, from other nations so as to be set apart for the worship of God. Does that make sense? But, as I say, that doesn't apply to gentility. So that's a bit of bad luck, isn't it, for the people who really want to use that. Now, for one of my friends who's the first openly gay Orthodox rabbi, Steve Greenberg, he's written a very interesting book about this. But one of the really interesting points, if you look, the difficulties, if you like, about this text from the Orthodox Jewish perspective is that, as you know, modern Jew Judaism, rabbinic Judaism, got going after Christianity, and in part in reaction to it, and depends quite a lot on writers like Philo of Alexandria for the basic structures of what they began to become much clearer about what was meant by that verse after the first century AD. <laughs> so even Philo, as I said, thought that that referred to shrine prostitution. But later, and in part because of a somewhat puritanical reaction that people had to the slutty life of Alexandria, the San Francisco of its day, um, uh, that um, people started to read the, that text against male-male sex, which was a new reading. And it's a new reading after Christianity, not from Christianity. <laughs> but it, may, it means, for instance, that we have rather, as Christians, we have rather more liberty to try and find out what Leviticus might have meant whenever it was written, which was sometime after the exile. But it was obviously bringing out much older texts and compiling them together. And one of the ways we can compare that is that the parallel passage from those Leviticus prohibitions in the book of Deuteronomy is very specifically and openly a prohibition against cult prostitutes. You shall not accept the wages of a dog, <laughs> dog being the slang term for a male cult prostitute, nor the wages of a harlot. Those were reckoned to be, you couldn't give those to the temple. That was improper earnings, immoral earnings. Is that what we would say? Immoral earnings. But it's quite clear that it was referring to cult prostitutes which would have been, as I say, a reality that was present at the time that everybody would have known about, people would have taken for granted, and everyone understood that the Hebrew people said, this is not what we're about. And they said, this is not what we're about because God should not be manipulated. Yeah? Well, we can go on and on with this. Very quickly, I'm going to jump to the most difficult passage in the New Testament on this one, which is the Romans one. You've heard this one before. Now, I challenge you, again, this is something better done uh, later or in a group. I challenge you to make a word document or whatever word processing document you use of the first two or three chapters of the letter to Romans 
and then run all the sentences together, and then remove all the numbers. Remove the verse numbers and the chapter numbers. And you will be shocked, shocked, to discover that you have been gravely misled in your understanding of Romans 1 by the chapter numbers. Because if you actually look at the very first word of Romans 2, verse 1, the word is, therefore, therefore is not a good word with which to begin a paragraph. <laughs> Your, your, your primary school writing teacher will have told you that. Therefore, indicates the beginning of the end of the argument. <laughs> right? So, if you've convinced yourself that the argument ends before the therefore, you're missing the point completely. So if you read the couple of verses immediately after the therefore, it says, therefore, O man, whoever you are, who are you to judge the people who do these things? Because you do exactly the same things yourselves. In other words, the one thing, whatever those verses mean, and we can go into that, the one thing, according to St. Paul, that none of us can ever do, is use whatever he's talked about before to judge people. And guess what? It's the one use that we make. <laughs> <laughs> over that passage. But actually, Paul's argument is really quite clever because what he's doing in those uh, verses from about 11 onwards in Romans is he's building up his Jewish listeners, Jewish Christian listeners, who are people who are, he wants to keep on side, as it were, by showing that, yep, he's one of them, he agrees with them. So he gives them a completely Jewish understanding spiel about idolatry and all the terrible things that go wrong as a result of idolatry. And you can hear them nodding at him, yeah, yeah, right on. In fact, he even says in the middle of it, amen, which is kind of the, the call for an audience response, with you, brother. You, you can imagine that that's actually the rhetorical style. He actually gives it away that this is a rhetorical exercise. He's building it up. He's saying about how these Gentiles, they do stupid things, they worship crocodiles and cats and reptiles, and this has led them to have lost minds, things like that. So it starts with idolatry, and because of idolatry, their minds get dim, and they do sillier and sillier things. And then it says, and then women do shameful things with women, or women do unnatural things with women. And what does that mean? Well, of course, if we read it nowadays, we think, aha, you see, lesbianism. But curiously, we have readers of that text between when Paul wrote it and 400 BC. And none of them thought it meant lesbianism. They thought it meant something much more terrifying. Women on top! <laughs> <laughs> Women in a non-missionary position. Women with dildos fucking men. Or each other. But on top! Ah! They were not remotely concerned with the gender issue. They were concerned with the power issue. That was what was unnatural. Women on top, that was what was considered unnatural. It was perfectly clear to St. Augustine and to St. Clement of Alexandria that that's what was being described. So when we look at that text, we see, well, look, it's a plain meaning of scripture. It certainly wasn't plain to the people who lived there closer to the time. And then it talks about Men doing shameful things with men and getting in their body the, what's it, the rewards of their something or other. The, the prize for their... Which would again, a reference perfectly understandable in uh, the first century, because the descendants of the cultic prostitutes were alive and well in the Mediterranean basin at the time of Paul. The goddess Cybele, or Aphrodite, different names, same grand earth mother figure, had Cults, actually, the, the, the biggest prostibulum for the cults was in Corinth, where Paul wrote that letter to the Romans. And 
at the cults, they would have acts of frenzied worship, and in the height of the frenzies, frenzies some of the men would castrate themselves. They would throw their former junk over the threshold of certain doors of the people who were going to be their patrons as priests, because they then became priests of Cybele. And Cy priests of Cybele were castrated males who had, rather like following the Vatican, really, um, had uh, <laughs> cast their junk on someone else. OK. Um, <laughs> I didn't say that. OK. Um, and there's, there's plenty of archaeological evidence of this, of this going on, because the bodies of such people have been found, including being buried with their priestly regalia, as priests of Cybele. In other words, this was something that anybody who lived within the soap opera that was the life of an ancient, medieval, uh, ancient Middle Eastern city or ancient Mediterranean city knew perfectly well. This was just perfectly standard. So what Paul was referring to would have been understood immediately as just the sort of thing that those stupid Gentiles get up to having followed on from uh, the cats and the reptiles and all that, they come down to this kind of stupid thing. And says St. Paul, and you know what? This leads to <gasps> terrible things. Some of them become <gasps> gossips and slanderers, disobedient to their parents, and ruthless and heartless. So unlike anybody we know. <laughs> Then he gives a little pinprick to the balloon. So you, whoever you are, why do you judge them? Because you're just like them. I.e., in all the things that matter, there's no difference between the Gentiles who do their weird things and you. You need Christ's salvation just as much as they do. Do you see the, do you see the purpose of that? It's actually very, very well structured. There's a, being, building up to a sting. It's a sting operation, right? And then once he's done that, you say, yeah, we're all on the same plane as this forever. And similar points can be made about every... Incidentally, if you want a, a good reading, we'll go back to Joe Ratzinger, yes, in his first in papal encyclical on love. He gives a reading of Romans 1, in which he explains it's entirely to do with idolatry. He doesn't even mention uh, the gay question, but that's a formal... It's comparatively rare that we have formal magisterial papal readings of texts of scripture, but that's one of them. And if you want permission to read Romans 1 without any reference at all to homosexuality, as it should be read, there you have it. In uh, no wilting flower he when it came to attacking gay people, but uh, <laughs> at least he, he knew that none of it was to be found in scripture. <laughs> Does that make sense? Well, I could go on and on and on. And, Perhaps I, I, I shouldn't do that, but I just wanted to finish with a little reminder of what this is really all about. This is not about giving you technical answers to technical questions. The kind of people who bash you over the head with those texts, they're not interested in discussion. For some reason or other, they're locked into a sacred space, uh, and the best thing to do is don't give the bastards free rental in your head. That's the beginnings of forgiveness. Don't, let, don't be run by the evil that is done to you. Okay, that's the first thing. But remember the example of the Gerasene demoniac. You know the story of the Gerasene demoniac? Jesus comes across the lake. He comes to a land which we know is not a Jewish land. Why do we know it's not a Jewish land? Pigs, pigs exactly. There are pigs. So he comes across the lake, comes to the land, Crazy Joe comes down the beach. What have you to do with us, son of the Most High? Strangely, Crazy Joe, in a non-Jewish land, greets Jesus with a term properly used of the Jewish high priest. What? That's part of the weirdness of Crazy Joe. The thing about Crazy Joe, <laughs> Crazy Joe has been the necessary satellite baddie <laughs> of his town. He's been the town whipping boy. He would have crazy fits, and they would tie him up, he would have more crazy fits, and he would break free, and they would tie him up. But after a bit, he became used to interjecting into himself all the punishments and the gashings, and so he would gash himself and whip himself. He didn't need anyone else to do it. In other words, he learned to self-harm as his way of living out the vibes of his community. And many of those of you who will have visited 
uh, mental health institutions, the people who work in mental health institutions, understand this reality perfectly well. Many of the people there are people who are living out other people's <coughs> dramas, but are weaker than they. So Crazy Joe is the perfect whipping boy. He gets to live out this series of multiple identities, which later gets referred to as Legion. That's the name he gives them. And yet he's necessary to them, because with him there, they know what good is. We good. And they know what bad is. Him bad. And Jesus comes along and is about to heal him when, first of all, he asks him what his name is. He says Legion. And then he asks him not to be sent away from that place because the demon is not stupid. The demon knows that it's a satellite demon. It does need to be somewhat physically close to the bad vibes. If you get too far away from the bad vibes, you might just start getting healed. So it doesn't want to go away. So you just say, that's fine. So it says, can you go into the pigs? So it says, go into the pigs. And into the pigs it goes. Here's the problem with pigs. They haven't learnt the human trick of building their unity over against a cast out other. They don't know how to escape pig. <laughs> they don't have a meeting and point all their trotters at each other. <laughs> No trotter pointing. So once they start imitating each other, off they go, down into the lake. This baffles the swine herd. Arr, where did my pigs go? <laughs> he goes back to the townspeople, and uh, they come out, and they're pretty surprised. And what do they see? They see Crazy Joe, now formerly Crazy Joe, seated, clothed, and in his right mind. In other words, humanized. He wasn't the sitting type before. You need to be in a peaceful position to be able to sit. Clothed, he was constantly gashing and casting and ripping everything. And in his right mind, he'd never had access to a right mind before. Why? Because his mind was totally run by the, the vibes of the group. He was their whipping boy, as it were. And when they detect this, they're very afraid. They see that something much bigger than them has come upon them. Something that's really shaken up the basis of their togetherness. Because Jesus has removed their whipping boy. And they don't know what to do, so they say to Jesus, um, they're very polite, they say, could you possibly go away? <laughs> and he doesn't say to them, and he's accepts something. He doesn't say, yeah, yeah, um, and curses be on you. It will be worse for you than Capernaum and Bethsaida and that. No, he doesn't. Because he knows they've, they've got an excuse. They haven't had the law and the prophets to teach them how not to scapegoat people. So, of course, it's too much for them too soon. So he makes as if to leave. And, uh, of course, formerly Crazy Joe now wants to come along as well. And uh, the, uh, Jesus, instead of saying to him, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men or whatever it is that he usually says to people or often says to people, he says, no, you go and tell the people what great things the Lord has done for you. Go to your home, your friends, and your family. And you can almost hear poor old now Saint Joe saying, Oh, shit. <laughs> home? Like, I have a home. Friends? You've seen them. Family? The worst of the lot? Couldn't a missionary expedition to Patagonia or Amarillo or somewhere? <laughs> but no, it gives him the toughest possible, uh, toughest possible missionary instruction in the New Testament. Go and be a humanized human being in the midst of people who still depend on a whipping boy for their sanity and survival, for whom you bad is the sign of they good. And it's only by, and merely by, you being human that you will humanize them. 
And it will be bloody dangerous for you as well. We don't get to hear the rest of the story, do we? But that's what I want to leave with you. The purpose of all of this is not so that any one of you have better arms or weapons with which to give technical responses to people, but that you be in that better place of being clothed, seated and in your right minds, so that you don't need to debate, but have more of an adaptive strategy, <laughs> I believe it's called technically, <laughs> of being alive and bearing witness in the midst of people many of whom will turn out to have much warmer hearts than they might seem to at first. Thank you very much. Questions are coming in, and uh, do feel free to send us questions if you have them. We'll um, try to get to as many as we can here in the next uh, about 20 minutes. Um, this is Tony Baker, our resident theology professor here, and so um, one of the one of the questions, and this is a theme that's coming up that people are sending in, is about scapegoating and how do we not scapegoat the scapegoaters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is, uh, this is why I call one of my book, books Faith Beyond Resentment. It's the most difficult thing to get rid of is resentment. And this is independently of straight or gay, it's just part of the uh, the nasty juice between people at this stage of modernity. <laughs> um, for me, I think that one of the signs of sanity in this is actually being able to recognize that such and such a person is your enemy. One of the sad things that happens in many of our uh, ways of thinking, I guess, is that we feel that everyone's got to feel good together. And that if one is a really progressive person, one should somehow be able to understand and have compassion with where everybody is, and so on, so on. We need to understand how to, to have such violence in whatever positions. Um, and actually, strangely, I think that's quite an imperialistic uh, move. I think that one of the things that is good to do is to remember that some people are your enemies. And that's quite simple. And then that you should learn to love your enemies. But loving your enemies does not mean pretending they're not your enemies. It means the very difficult task of learning how to be toward them without being over against them at all. This is how St. Matthew describes, you know, the father, your father who makes the sun to rise on sinners and uh, impious, uh, the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. How to be towards someone without being over against them at all. Now that's, a, that's quite an ascetic exercise <laughs> because um, it's in a sense far easier to score cheap brownie points by being victimary um, by playing the victim role, and of course, they're as good at playing the victim role as anybody else. And two victims playing the victim role is the ultimate dead end. So, then you say, actually, these people are my enemies, but I'm not going to hold that against them. I'm not going to let them run me. But I am going to carry on as if they weren't actively against me. And I'm going to carry on, including being able to lose in front of them. Because that's what the bigness that is Christ is. 
it's having the power to lose, not having to win. And because you have the power to lose, there's nothing they can take away from you. That's the whole point. So I think that, yeah, I, I, it seems an odd thing to say, but I think that a great deal of our time, emotional time, is spent trying to pretend that people who are our enemies aren't really our enemies, if only we understood them better. And often that leads to imperialist and, and condescending ways of, of, uh, uh, of treating them, like endless discussions about who voted for who in the last election and why, and, you know, uh, why people in my country voted for Brexit and so on and so forth. <coughs> Sometimes you have to say, okay, for where I am, is it's a limited space. But such and such a people are my enemies, and so I must love them. And I must love them because, not because Jesus wants me as a doormat, but because he wants me to be free. And that means not to be run by those who wish me evil. <laughs> does, that, does, that, does that kind of make sense? Yeah, I was really interested in your... Um the way that the sort of the bigness of Christ image that you were giving us there connects with the, the idolatry stuff that you were talking about earlier, and the the idea that uh, it not maybe not throughout Scripture, but in a, a good bit of Scripture, um, the uh, the sort of the power plays against human groups are actually sort of if you you know, take it into a Jewish context, it's actually a form of idolatry, yeah. as if you're saying well, God needs us to sort of sort out the evil and the good. Yeah. Um, and so that just sort of that first of all that's a fascinating connection and then the, the way that that connects with the there's a connection I think in the in the Christology piece too just about um, our sort of maybe try this out it seems like there might be a way that we can sort of uh, flip to another kind of idolatry by saying God needs us to sort of sort of refrain from this activity that you know sort of needs us to you know, maybe the enemies thing needs us to not have any enemies anywhere because God needs us to create the kind of world like that when in fact the, Christ, the Christological message is it's not not a scapegoating it's a sort of it's a sort of God over scapegoating in a way that sort of invites a new kind of a new kind of um, end of the sort of that practice so I don't know, there's a there's sort of lots that you were doing that I wanted to make sort of connections to, and I thought maybe if I just threw that back at you, mm. you, could, you could say something interesting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, think think about what, what scapegoating, what we call scapegoating. So remember the, the the word the word scapegoat has come to have its modern meaning starting in the 17th century. It was actually the result of Calvinist preaching. It was Calvinist preachers in the 17th century <coughs> who first started to use the word scapegoat, which they borrowed from Leviticus, obviously, in its modern sense. And its modern sense means something quite specific and really extraordinarily anthropologically rich. If you say someone is a scapegoat, you mean it is someone who is universally held to be guilty, but falsely so, because that person is really innocent. That's an extraordinary amount of cultural information to carry in one word. It's actually it's an amazing uh, uh, discovery. And what is it that has enabled us to start to detect this? And this is where... Um, Girard's writing is particularly, is particularly illuminating. Because it's how we are brought together over against someone. Anyone will do. The whole point of what Girard initially called the mechanism of the surrogate victim or the mechanism of the grand word aleatory victim, aleatory from throwing dice, random, uh, victim is precisely that it really doesn't matter who gets it so long as someone does but we do need to be convinced that we are right in who we're going after so we come up with certain uh, what is the word typical accusations 
Someone is too tall or too short, too rich or too poor, limps slightly, is too fat or too thin, too something. <laughs> there has to be at least a posteriori, a reason given <laughs> for why they were the person who was uh, responsible. You know, Oedipus being the obvious example of a scapegoat. He had a swollen ankle, so he limped. In all the myths, almost invariably, there is something wrong with the figure who gets, uh, who gets lynched. There's some, there's some quote unquote, uh, stereotypical either crime or What Jesus does by occupying the place of all those is to show that all those accusations are lies. Thus leaving us with the very difficult task <laughs> of always having to be suspicious of all our attempts at building unity. Especially when we found someone convenient over against whom <laughs> uh, to make that unity. And that can be for reasons of race. Uh, the history of lynchings uh, is very evident of exactly that. It's goodness created at the expense of a particular group, held to be dangerous in certain fictitious ways. And where guilt was not real, <laughs> guilt will be provided. <laughs> the accusation will be made, and a jury will be made to stick it. Uh, so putting us in the position where we have to be suspicious of our own attempts to build unity over against anyone, that's a tough measure. But that's inseparable from the gospel of grace. Does that, does that yeah. begin to answer that? Yeah. Thanks, James. Here's one more. That's, um, there are several questions along this theme, and it has to do with when scapegoating occurs and the rationale for it is that what we're doing in scapegoating you is actually for your good. Like there's something pathological that our scapegoating is designed to cure or alleviate in you for your good. Can you speak to that phenomenon? Well, of course, the people who are doing that wouldn't call it scapegoating. Uh, they would say they're loving you. Um, and yeah, they're loving you, and so they send you to reparative therapy. And then we could say that is a form of, uh, of scapegoating. But remember that if scapegoating starts to get used as an accusation, <coughs> then, as it were, we fall into it again. <laughs> That's, uh, it's not a useful term when it's used as an accusation. If we want to see how is this building up a group's, a group's unity. One of the things which we, we can never do is see when we are scapegoating. And I think that's worth, worth thing to remember. This is something we can see with everybody else, and it's something we find it very, very difficult to see for ourselves. So remember that the most difficult thing about this way of thinking is that it means an end to innocence. And that's bad news for a culture like your own, which has so much invested in people being innocent, people being the good guys. Yeah? It means there ain't no good guys. <laughs> uh, how can we sinners make the mess a little less messy? Uh, but that's very difficult. Lots of people don't want that. Lots of people want ways to sort out who the good guys and the bad guys are. And that, the trouble with that is that the best way to do that is by scapegoating. <laughs> so if we take Girard's understanding seriously, what it does is it's a constant reminder, no innocence here. Innocence is extremely dangerous. I am much more likely to be killed by your goodness than by your evil. It's when we think we're being really good that we are really dangerous. And remember how much we have invested in, uh, in being good. And we kind of know that. People who are 
not particularly good are much less frightening. Sometimes good people can be terrifying. And I think we're right to be terrified. So that's, it's a bit counterintuitive, but that's a very, very important part of, uh, of what's going on. Goodness isn't obvious. <laughs> and working out how easily we are caught up thinking ourselves good in forms of evil. I was fascinated by a friend of mine who lives in Charlottesville, your neighboring university city. Um, and he was there at the time of the recent uh, disturbances. He's Mennonite, uh, so fully involved in peace initiatives and so forth. And yet he reported the extraordinary draw of the excitement of being involved in an all against the bad guys. In that particular case, there was a guy called Kessler and the neo-Nazi leader Richard Spencer. But he who's, you know, prepared and done meditation and knows how to keep calm in situations, he's actually a former military, so he has just about as much experience in knowing how to keep calm in situations as you can get. The contagion of a group building up to the excitement of doing something good, meaning getting the bastard, is more or less unstoppable. It's very difficult for us not to be caught up in the contagion of fake goodness at the expense of someone else. So it's worthwhile just remembering how prone we are to that and trying to check ourselves when, when we feel those hooks uh, coming into us because you know, we're more likely to be led astray by someone who offers us a shiny piece of goodness, that's Lucifer, than by someone who offers us a less than clear piece of moral ineptitude. Does that make sense? <laughs> What do you think the uh, uh, Christian practices are that can help um, sort of transform that impulse? Mm. If I knew I'd be a much richer man than I am. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I mean, I think that it's, it can only be part of a journey of the sort that I attempted to describe in the, in the homily today of uh, a penitential journey, a realization of when I have been caught up in such things, what my triggers are, um, how easily I'm able to be yanked by certain uh, chains into getting on a crusading horse, uh, and how, how easy it is, and how exciting it is to be involved in something like that. And I think that's, that's the really difficult thing. I think this is where, where the, the role of meditation, contemplation comes in, is um, you have to be prepared to let go of cheap meaning. And it's so difficult to get meaning in our lives. We're so grateful when someone gives a little bit of meaning to it that we can go all haywire <laughs> running after it. And actually being prepared to sit over time and allow our Father who sees in secret to give us meaning rather than grabbing at the first thing. That's an ascetical exercise, but I think it's one worth doing if we can. But uh, I would be even more hypocritical than usual if I said much more than that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, we maybe have time for just this last question, so we'll end here and then let people come up and maybe ask you more mm -hmm. during the book signing. Um, so a few of these questions are speaking on behalf of um, when we have been on the receiving end of uh, hateful messages and have internalized those hateful messages mm -hmm. about ourselves. And you know, you've written a whole book on being liked by mm -hmm. God. Can you just speak to how we can um, uh, right. deal with yeah. those yeah. internalized messages. 
Yes. Well, that, that's that's part of the same. That's part of the same thing. You're you're absolutely right. We we're inclined to receive, as if directed to us, uh, hateful lies, and it takes some time actually to be able to say, no, that's a lie rather than thinking, well, maybe they know something about me, maybe it's true, and so on and so forth. That's a lie. The one who knows me and likes me would only ever tell me the truth in a way that would build me up. You can tell me truth that might be very hard, but it would build me up. <laughs> it wouldn't put me down. And I would know when I'm being told the truth that builds me up, even if it's, even if it's humiliating, because we can tell the difference. So learning to understand that God likes us is different from hearing the word God loves us, because we often have to take the word love to the laundry, because people use the word love as a control freak word. You know, it's Miss Piggy language. I love you, therefore you shall do exactly what I say. <laughs> and she's the great example of, of uh, emotional, emotional blackmail with love language, isn't it? Isn't that right? But we're, but we're, <laughs> but we're used to, we're used to, we're used to that. And far too often, the word "I love you" means so get in line with what I want from you. Whereas the whole point of like is that actually you know when someone likes you because they're not trying to run you. They're alongside you. They're quite interested to see where you're going. They enjoy your company. They don't particularly want to transform you into whatever it is that they think you need to be. But they don't even need to say anything. You can tell that someone likes you non-linguistically just by their way of being, uh, being alongside you. So I think it's tremendously important to recover uh, the sense of likedness by God. This is my son, the beloved, it says, on whom my favor rests, in whom I am complacent. Saint Jerome says, complacui. Of course, complacent in English doesn't sound very good. But it basically means, hmm, and that's it. It's learning to listen to, hmm, looking at you, I'm the cat that's got the cream. And you can hear things from the cat who's got the cream, <laughs> because they know, they know you're part of the cream. And then you can start to realize that other voices that seem to come from God actually come from, oh, I don't know, retread preaching cycles from the 1950s. Because <laughs> um, that's usually what, what, whatever passes as orthodoxy or tradition or what God said is usually a couple of generations ago's preaching cycle. But with all the pain of not having worked between generations, having sorted out. But so is that the beginning of a beginning of an answer? Um, thank you so much. Uh, I have a few thank yous I want to pass out. First of all, to you all for being here. This is this was a really fun night for us. Um, we are a seminary who's trying to do all trying to do some really creative work and uh, thinking together about uh, what it means to be humans before God and all its many theological and uh, exegetical and psychological dimensions and this was a there's no better I think uh, speaker who could help us help us along that path uh, and no better event than this so thanks thanks to you all um, I want to say thanks to uh, to Jason and Jenna Minix uh, who did so much legwork organizing this and Jason's whole team from Vox stand for us we don't know you all Well, Cynthia, I knew that there were guests here because there were so many good-looking people on campus. So it was going to be. Um, 
Um, and then especially, um, I want to thank you, uh, Father James Allison, for your time, uh, for being here. I know you were part of a whirlwind tour of Austin that you're doing uh, over the next several days. Usually being whirlwind, they don't go well in <laughs> <laughs> You are the whirlwind. You brought the whirlwind. Uh, thank you for being here with us. Thank you for sharing with us for uh, the knowledge that you've brought and the way that you have started a conversation that I hope uh, we can continue as, uh, as, as we move forward.